Um, hello, my name is Gabrielle Hurd. I'm with the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. Today is July 11th, 2023, and we are in Pensacola at the Pensacola Public Library. And who am I interviewing today? Lachelle Johns. Would you mind spelling that for the record? L-A-C-H-E-L-L-E-J-O-H-N-S. Great, thank you. Um, uh, when and where were you born? Um, I was born August 6, 1982, in Charleston, West Virginia. How did you come to Pensacola? My parents um, in the 80s, well, West Virginia is very behind, so in the 80s, um, a lot of racism still. My dad's white, my mom's black, so my dad, his parents were like getting him fired from all of his jobs. Um, trying to break them up. So he joined the military and we ended up in Pensacola for a while. Um, we went to Charlotte for most of my like middle school, high school. And then I kind of rambled around for a while and found my way back down here. Mm. What was your time like in Pensacola when you were a kid? I don't have a whole lot of memories from when I was a kid. Um, I remember uh, a lot of not fitting in so much. Uh, being in the South in an interracial family wasn't really like the thing. <laughs> um, so, you know, I remember a lot of tumult around that when I was young and, and uh, some pretty negative experiences from like the church perspective. Um, so we're very spiritual people, but not very religious people. Um, and let's see, I got hit by a car here on foot when I was nine. And uh, that changed my life. And um, beyond that, it, just the beach. Mm. Like the fr anything free that we could do. And the beach was just like this safe haven, you know, that's kind of always been a vein of my whole existence. Like if I can't sleep in the middle of the night, I'll get my djembe and go to the beach and play my drum at two in the morning and it calms me, you know, and I'll go home and be able to sleep. So really the beach is a big standout. How old were you when you were living here? Like what was the age range? Um, we moved here when I was probably, oh, we had some duty stations. Probably three or four, four, probably four until whatever age you are in like fifth grade. Fifth grade? Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, um, what stands out to you about the time when you were here versus where you went next? Like you said you, your family experienced a lot of sort of racism in the South because as an interracial family, um, what kind of stuck out to you once you got older and you realized that's not normal? <laughs> Um, I mean, I think I pretty much, my mom was very, uh, open with us and, and so we knew it wasn't normal, you know, even when we were young, uh, we just like hate never feels normal, you know, but it does like, you get kind of like callous to it. So it does have like kind of a normalcy once you're, once you're in it for a while. Yeah. Um, but you know, moving up North, which is still kind of the South Charlotte, um, it was a little, it was hidden, you know, it wasn't so outright. I feel like a lot more people were just in care. Um, yeah. like it wasn't really as spoken about. Um, you know, I think when I was 14, I got in trouble and I had to go to work with my mom during the summer because I couldn't be trusted to be alone. Um, and 
that was the first time I, I remember really seeing it up there. I went to work with her and she was an accountant. She had just, she went to University of West Florida and graduated from there. I graduated from there. My sister came back and graduated from there. Um, and she started her career in accounting in, at a um, train company. And all of the black women, there were no black men. Mm -hmm. There was a handful of black women and they all worked on the bottom floor in the back of the building. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, like, Ma, you can't see that. Like, I thought she couldn't see it, you know, and she was just like, of course I can see it, you know, but I'm starting out and this is where I am and I'm getting my start and I'm going to prove myself. And she was very uh, strong like that. Like, it doesn't matter where she is or who's around her. She's going to make an impact on them and prove who she is and who we are as people. So it was important to her to not run from that. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the the main difference was just that here it was very in your face. Like there were rallies, yeah, <laughs> still <laughs> in Pensacola. Um, you know that you're kind of sheltered from when you're younger, and and oh, we're just going to turn this way and don't look at that. Um, you know, but sometimes my mom would just sit us down and be like, "Look, this is what that was," and it exists and it exists in our family and kind of how to deal with it, mm -hmm. um, not to internalize it, to talk about it and then kind of move from there. But up North, it was just, it was still there. It was just hidden. Do you think having to deal with that really direct, um, racism changed the way you react to inequality? Do you think, um, if you grew up up North, you would just have shrugged it off more? I don't think so. Um, like my dad was a big hippie and my mom was pretty revolutionary. So it was just like kind of part of life to go against it. Yeah. Um, so no, I don't, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think I would have burnt out a little more frequently down here. Um, but I've been back here for almost 20 years mm -hmm. and um, still alive and well when I came back, mm -hmm. you know? So uh, I think my freshest memories of, of dealing with it are very head on mm -hmm. uh, from when I, I'm 40 now. So I was 20, you know, coming back and still being like a wild revolutionary, but just with a kid. <laughs> <laughs> what brought you back to Pensacola? Um, I had a child and I went through a divorce. Well, it wasn't a divorce yet. It was just some tumult. Um, he had decided that he was going to join the Coast Guard and then like was out of there after about a month. And so I was like, we're going somewhere else. Um, I need something different. I don't want to be in the city. I want to be back in nature, whether that's the mountains or the beach or wherever we need to go. And my dad had bought a house here when we were stationed here and the tenants moved out and he was like, there's an open house in Pensacola. And we celebrated our daughter's first birthday and then packed up a U-Haul and moved down here the very next day. Um, so when you came down here, how did you, what were you expecting? Like what, what was your goal when you came down here? I really didn't have one. It was just get out of the current situation, get a new start. I guess see if we could jump start and and clear the air. Um, you know that didn't happen, but it was definitely where like I me coming back was definitely what needed to happen. So yeah, one of how did you get involved with the punk house here? So I did, I would just go to shows <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, I didn't have too much interaction with the punk house until Scott started, Scott and Lauren purchased it and started raising funds and, and stuff like that for the punk house. I was involved, I met them through poetry actually. Um, 
he had commissioned me to write some poetry for this thing they were doing at the um, art gallery. And I got very involved in open books, prison books project and brought my kids there to, to connect them and start their journey in, in serving others. And um, like me and Lauren and Scott all had kids kind of the same age and we were all kind of of the same, you know, mindset and, and I started to get really involved in a lot of the things that he was doing and when he started the um, fundraising for the punk house to kind of revamp it because it was nasty. Um, <laughs> he asked me to come and perform and I went to uh, the museum that was hosting and performed. I was like eight months pregnant, like <laughs> way out here and I couldn't even barely walk like and because I was like so like top heavy and so I like put my djembe drum on my back and to like balance myself and like went and performed and and uh it was beautiful it was a beautiful uh collection of people and like so many people that came out that weren't even involved in the punk scene at all you know they just supported this autonomy of self and this this revolutionary spirit and um it was really beautiful i want to go back i want to talk to about how you got into poetry and what led you to all that <laughs> so when you came to pensacola you were 20 when did you, were you already into poetry then um, i was i thought i was going to be a journalist for a long time when i was young um and i, I think i started writing poetry when i was about fourth grade which aligns with when I first was introduced to punk um, and I felt like this rage like this fourth grade rage is like <laughs> a weird thing to picture um, but I felt this like need to impact people and to like speak for people and and to get things out of me that I couldn't get out other than like artistically and I can't I would see pictures in my mind, like I would see these beautiful paintings in my mind, but I have no visual artistic talent, none. <laughs> and so like, I started to describe those things and the feelings behind those things and seeing those pictures and trying to get it out in words instead. And it turned into like, like I still see pictures when I'm, inspired to do something or I'll hear a pattern um, and I'll be inspired to write something but it usually looks like a story in my mind um, and then it just comes. I love that. <laughs> I love that so much. Where, what got you into punk? Um, so I had two really dope teachers here at Ferry Pass Elementary School, Mr. Wolf and Miss Martin and I don't remember names at all and I don't remember a lot about my childhood like but I remember them and Miss Martin was a, a crazy hippie but she was a math teacher just so awesome and Mr. Wolf was a science teacher and he would bark at you <laughs> and he was like super he had this like punk I didn't know what it was you know but he had just like this punk spirit and and uh he actually was the first, he ran the first protest that I ever was involved in, in fourth grade. And- Do you remember what it was for? Oh yeah. <laughs> I remember that vividly. Um, so there used to be these nets that the fishing ships would use to catch mahi. Mm -hmm. And the way that they were built, they would also catch a lot of dolphin. And there was a movement against that. Uh, it was kind of like when PETA first started being like a really big voice mm -hmm. in society. And, and I got really into like animal, anti-animal testing and like, you know, all of these things became a vegetarian and all that stuff. And, um, he was like teaching us about it because we had a marine biology track in fourth grade. And, um, he took us out to the beach and, there were, you know, there was netting, there was, I mean, just some of the trash on the beach. He was like, 
you know, outraged by it, you know, and I just saw him like, yes, yes. <laughs> and he was like, we're going to tell them what we think. Yeah. And we went back to the school and we took the soccer nets off of the goals and we wrapped ourselves in them and we created signs and we stood out in front of Fairy Pass Elementary and protested these nets. Like it was incredible. It was incredible. That's amazing. That's so is that that's where that 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 the poetry came from. Oh, like, yeah. Punk poetry. What did you like growing up? What were you you said you wanted to use your voice to help people like what is were you an environmentalist? Like what did you want to speak for? Everything that was wrong. Like <laughs> anybody that was picked on, you know, like it's not like like back then it's not. I have kids that are 21, 16, and four. Mm -hmm. And my 21 and 16 year old, like people now look at that, those generations like, oh, they're so sensitive, <laughs> you know, whatever, you know, like these kids, they just, we can't say anything right. And like, you know, the woke generation and all this stuff, right? But what people don't understand is that like, those kids aren't speaking for themselves. Mm -hmm. They're speaking for others, you know, like they're going out of their way to like make sure that people feel included yeah. and like fuck everybody else that's, you know, not making them feel that way. And that wasn't how it was, you know, always it was, it was backwards, you know, like these kids are different. These kids are outcasts and, and I never could wrap my head around that. Um, and then there's kind of like a hippie spirit to that too. Like punks and hippies are so the same, but just different aesthetic. different approaches, you know, <laughs> like, like the different, like the difference between like Martin Luther King Jr. And Malcolm X, like that's a difference. That's the only difference between punks and hippies, like mm -hmm. is the, the approach. Um, but I just went off on a whole tangent and, no, I love and it. forgot the whole, I love it. What did, what, where I was going. Did you say your parents were sort of hippies? My dad was a giant hippie. He was barefoot, <laughs> no shirt. Hippie. <laughs> um, my mom was very responsible, like for her six brothers and sisters. And cause my mom's mom had like paranoid schizophrenia and then she got hit by a car and had a brain injury. So like, you know, back then they were still doing electroshock therapy in West Virginia and on, you know, m people of color. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and that was after it was known that we shouldn't be doing that. Um, so like my mom had the responsibility of her family and she was the oldest daughter. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from very young, she was very responsible. And then she met my dad and he was like wild and he like used to deal drugs to her older brother. And then he was like, Oh, you're beautiful. And you know, and, uh, and it kind of grew from there. And my mom's, you know, still been very responsible and not kind not so out there, but she got a lot of that revolutionary, you know, stuff from him. And, and, uh, she's a writer in her own respect. She won't claim it, but she is. And so, you know, I had a lot of that influence um, from them for sure. How did, so you were, how did the poetry grow from, you know, you were in the, the fourth grade and you started writing poetry and you were doing it when you were 20. Um, how did you start performing? Um, <laughs> um, so I haven't seen her in like <laughs> two years. Um, so, I guess when I first started performing, so I graduated, um, in Charleston, I mean, in Charlotte and I went straight into theater school at the college of Charleston. And I, like I started performing theatrically first in high school. And then, um, you know, my poetry was just kind of mine. And when I got involved in theater, like I got this, public speaking ease, you know, and like, Oh, we can, we can do this. 
And then I went, I used to go to this place in Charleston called the horse and car. That's where I went to college for like 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> and I partied out. I was 16. Like I skipped my junior year of high school and was like, I'm out and, and partied. But, um, I used to go to this coffee shop all the time called the horse and cart downtown on King street. And, um, they had an open mic and I was like, Oh, and like I hadn't written for a while. And when you step back into that space, it's like all this, everything comes rushing back and all of a sudden you're fucking writing all the time and you've got, you know, you always make sure you have a pad and stuff like that. And, um, so I really started like to rekindle that when I was 16, I had a couple of years of lull where I was doing like more journalistic writing and not so much poetry. Um, but as soon as I hit that stage the first time and read something that I had written long ago, it was done. Like I've been doing it, um, ever since, as soon as I found one here, there was a long time where I didn't know that it existed here. Mm -hmm. And then I was in college at UWF and somebody said, you should go to this thing. And she took me when it was at Sluggo's, um, downtown and I came off this, well, I went and I had four poems that I was going to do. And Q, the guy on the mic was like the host. He was like, you know, reminding everybody about the length of things and stuff. And so he was like two pieces and I was like, Oh, so I was so sad. I was like ready to get this out, you know? And I just <laughs> like made my four pieces, two pieces. <laughs> like wrote a couple lines to join him and like, and he peeped the game for sure. And, but I came off the, the mic and he was like, Hey, he grabbed me by my shoulders, which mm -hmm. normally I would have had a less favorable reaction to, but like, you know, he grabbed me by my shoulders and he was like, you've got to come, you got to keep coming. Um, people need to hear what you're saying is I did a piece about Carlos and Smith. And, uh, he was like, you need to, you need to come and help me educate these people on black history and, and what we need to be doing to get better. Mm -hmm. And I've been going every Tuesday since then. I, I think I'm, my son was seven and he's 16. So almost two years, almost 10 years. That's amazing. It's amazing. And he's involved in the scene as well. Both of my kids write. Um, my 16 year old has been writing and performing poetry since he was seven on stage at Sluggos and <laughs> bars and stuff like in front of massive crowds of adults um, since he was seven. I love that. He hosted the Pensacola Poetry, co hosted with Q for two years. Um, but that's actually where he is now, and we'll be going after this. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do, what do you see the the like connection between poetry and activism that you're talking about? Like you were saying, you were talk, your poem was about Carlos and Smith. Like, talk about that. So, um, Carlos and Smith were athletic. Um, they were athletes. Um, there's an iconic picture, which will probably be more connectable. Um, where it's two black men in first and second and a white man in third. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that that had happened in the Olympic mm -hmm. arena. And both of them were like this. And so was the white man. Mm -hmm. And there was so much outrage. And so I saw that picture in my mind and I just went on this journey, um, of what we need, you know, being freed and, and uniting and, and fighting for each other. And, and, um, that was just such a beautiful moment that became like this point of contention that completely took the beauty out of it for a while, you know? So I think like poetry kind of naturally, when you have a mic, mm -hmm or you have somebody that's going to sit and read what you've written, like what an injustice to not fight for someone, you know? Yeah. And that's like, punk is very much about that. Like punk is like 
a group of, of people that want to fight however they have to and endure whatever they have to for the individual autonomy of self, for people to have rights, basic rights. And as anarchist as it, it can be and feel sometimes, like it's not just about fighting against a system. It's about fighting for each other and being sufficient mm -hmm. and, and understanding and being knowledgeable and being able to go and fight and speak from an, a place of understanding that's higher than what you can learn in a book or, you know, mm -hmm. like really connecting people and saying like, I don't care who I am or who you are, your rights are being invaded. I'm going to fight for you and with you and beside you, no matter what that means. That's beautiful. That's great. Tell me, tell me about how you use poetry to fight for people's rights at the punk house or at Sluggos. Like, I want to hear more about what you're doing today with that. So we have a lot of, um, a lot of us that were just kind of like wandering punks, like just fighting for individual things are now like successful integrated parts of society that are still fighting but in ways that can have more impact yeah right and so like when you can get and and a lot of us are artistic you know a lot of them are musicians a lot of people are you know graffiti artists a lot of people are photographers you know uh writers and so there's like this community of people that is kind of expanding mm -hmm. like the definition of punk used to be so like a little bit elitist <laughs> you know like oh you're not punk you know <laughs> like and and now it just looks like everyone yeah you know and um so like if we can take our our poetry and raise money to to purchase a house that means a lot to the punk community and turn it into something that means a lot to the community at large. You know, like there's a recording studio in the punk house that's free and open to the public, like by schedule, you know, there's an artist in residence program. Like, I mean, there's just so much that comes from this, you know, and you see the punk house and open books and, and a lot of, you know, food, not bombs and a lot of the nonprofits in town that come together yeah. to, to raise money and support different causes. Or, you know, I wasn't here when this was happening, but like, you know, the abortion clinic that used to be in Pensacola and all the punks would would go and stand and take rotations and go and stand and protect the people while they were walking in yeah. from these violent protests, you know, like all of that comes together at a place where art touches more than you could ever mm -hmm. touch just arguing about shit. You know, like you, if you put a, if you put a good enough beat on anything, people will listen to it yeah. and they won't even realize what's being said until they've listened to it a few times. But by then their hearts are already open. Yeah. Their minds are a little more open, you know? So like taking something that, everybody values and making it stand for someone else or for yourself is a very um, digestible way to get into people's hearts and minds and plant seeds, you know, along the way. I love that. I, I want to hear more about, um, I want to get to the punk house. I want to talk about the punk house. There's so much, there's so much you know, there's so much background. So, so tell me, when you started the punk house, you were doing activism before that with, um, about banned books and open books for prisons. What, were, what was that about? So open books is another Scott Satterwhite. Scott Satterwhite means so much to this community. Like, I can't even express, like, him and his, the punk community that was, thriving, maybe not thriving, but it was there, um, and making big impact, um, on a very personal scale. Um, they mean so much to, to Pensacola, like Scott and Lauren, you know, I know you guys have, have spoken with them, but you know, 
they've given everything mm. to the people of Pensacola. And like open books, you know, I got involved in open books. I've, I've been involved in, you know, women's rights protests, you know, all kinds of different things. But, um, you know, I got involved with open books first, uh, around the same time that I got involved in poetry. Um, now I kind of got lost. What was your question again? <laughs> I was asking, asking about like what type of activism led up to the punk house? Um, so I think the punk house just started by like punks needing a place to live and being basically broke. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wasn't around when, like, during the heyday of the punk house, like, I just got involved in the punk house, like, mm. when they started to make it into what it is today. Would you mind telling me, what was it, uh, just for the, for the record, what was, what was the punk house before you got there? Like, how did it start? Um, a bunch of broke ass kids, <laughs> you know, punks that needed a place to be a place to live and and be free mm -hmm. um and they just kind of all they found this house and they just all chipped in and uh as much as they could so they packed as many people as they could into the house and and uh bands live there and then you know like and there's punk houses all over or there have been punk houses all over the country so like you know the punk genre was a lot smaller than it is now. And so like they would do house parties and, and, you know, even feed, mm -hmm. you know, each other and have community days and sit on the porch and feed each other and feed people that needed to be fed. Um, but it was, it was a grimy place from what I understand, <laughs> um, where a lot of debauchery went down, but like, <laughs> also a lot of good happened, like all the organizing for, for the protest against the Klan rallies and the protests, you know, the counter protest against the abortion center. And, you know, a lot of bands grew up there and, and flourished there. Um, but also like traveling, huge traveling bands that yeah. went from city to city would come and stay there while they were playing at the handlebar or, you know, wherever they were going to play, they would do house shows and stuff like that. So it was really just like a, a community space where people could kind of get in there and pay a hundred bucks to live That's in a great. closet, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, um, but I, I think the evolution was very, it makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. for it to evolve into like this, this clean now <laughs> because now we're adults and we have a little more access to, you know, resources. So this like clean space for people to come and create mm -hmm. that wouldn't have the opportunity to create otherwise, you know, not everybody can afford to record. Yeah. And, you know, like I used it this weekend, um, to work on a book, my publishing, my first book of poetry. And I have a very hectic life. And I was just like, yo, Scott, bro, I've got to get this down. I've got to get it together. And I just need a space. Yeah. And there's no artists in residence there this this month or next month. And he was like, yeah, go to the house and mm -hmm. use the artist in residence room. And and I did. And it was like, you know, I needed to remove myself from work. I need to remove myself from responsibility of home, mm -hmm. you know, and and live in my creative space for a few days and get it done. And, um, I did, and I partied and I <laughs> put it together and I'm, it was insane. Like I went to places like I would be like, Oh God, it's already, you know, morning. I'm going to go get some breakfast. And I went to CJ's and had breakfast and I'm sitting at the bar and here comes Gabe like sitting, but Hey, can, is this seat taken? And I was like, Oh my God, you know, like here I am staying at the punk house and one of the original, you know, people, people from the punk house comes <laughs> moseying up and sits down, you know, and I know him, you know, through tattoos and general things around town. But like, I was like, Oh man. And I just kept running into people, <laughs> you know, like, and I was like, I'm supposed to be here, you know, like, you know, when you, the universe sends you signs that like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. 
you know, and, and Gabe and his give me a squeeze is one of those things, you know, like. What's Gabe's full name? <sighs> I'm so bad with names. That's okay. <laughs> like, uh, I don't know his last name. That's okay. Yeah. He, if you, if you Google Hula Moon, he'll come up. He's like famous tattoo artist. Um, well storied tattoo artist. That sounds great. Well, um, well, what is it? Tell me about more about how you guys um, got the punk house going and what you're doing with it today. So I take zero credit for anything that the punk house is <laughs> right now. But, um, you know, I think Scott and Lauren and, and some of the old punks had that lived in the house for a long time and really had a lot of love for it. Uh, saw it dilapidated and, and, you know, it's, I mean, it's been functioning mm -hmm. as a punk house. So like punks <laughs> have been living there forever, but they were just like, we need to make this something. Yeah. And, um, I mean, Scott just tapped me and was like, Hey, you want to do this? And then as soon as I saw it, I was like writing for grants from my employer and like, it feels so good to take corporate money and like, <laughs> I, and I wrote the grant for 309 Punk House and like, I was like, are you guys really giving me like thousands of dollars for the Punk House? Like word, um, you know, so my part is just, I mean, I guess I was just voted onto the board for volunteer coordinating, but I haven't done it yet. That was like very recent. Um, but you know, just being there for them, bringing volunteers in, bringing my kids in, um, getting the money wherever I can get them money from and, and trying to support it, yeah. um, because it's something that needs to be prioritized. Tell me about if someone's in Pensacola or going through Pensacola, what should they do with the punk house? Like what's happening there it, today? They should go to a show like, or, I mean, they have an artist in residence program where they bring in artists that live in the house for different varying periods of time and they create and they put on art shows or they put on, you know, punk shows or, you know, whatever their medium is for art. Yeah. You know, they're bringing people into the house and, and charging a small menial cover and, yeah. and bringing people in to see the artists from all over the country, you know, like, I mean, Scott and Lauren have connections to people all over the world, you know, in different punk houses and things like that. So, you know, really bringing some of that punk culture and like the DIY culture into the hands of everyone. So like if you're going through Pensacola, looking up the 309 punk house and seeing is there a show, is there an artist in residence, is there, um, you know, things that have been integrated into Pensacola, like nights on the tracks, you know, because the Amtrak goes right by the house, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that's another thing like that house used to be a stopover mm -hmm. during prohibition. Oh, And so there's like, you know, there was like secret doors and stuff like that. <laughs> and so it had this like grimy revolutionary spirit, even before the punks were there, you know, but like, it's been really integrated into the community. You know, they're showing up at pride month events. And I mean, just anything where people are fighting for other people, the punk house is there. I love it. Tell me, um, tell me where should people go to look at the punk house, look up the punk house and where should people go to look up your poetry so that people listening can find out. I wish I already had it published. Um, there's not much of it you can find out there as far as my poetry, but for 309, I mean, they can Google 309 punk house, Pensacola, and it'll take you to the website and the website's very informative. Um, the Facebook, I, I don't do a lot of social media, so I don't really have like Instagram and all that, but I'm sure they're there. Um, but if you Google 309 punk house, you'll be able to find what's going on, what they're into. Um, there's ways to like donate or, or set up a scheduled donation. Um, but I would definitely, yeah, I would okay. definitely attend a show <laughs> if you could. I know I want to attend a show. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's awesome. It's all, there's nothing like it. It's like a, a little family and the young punks are so cool. <laughs> like they're like, I would caution them not to get back to like an elitist kind of mentality, but like 
and understand that punk like punk isn't the thing it's the it's the fucking words um it's like what you said earlier it's, it's the, the mindset openness. of it right yeah. it's like it's not just punk like punk means nothing on its own mm -hmm. you know but like really embodying the spirit of of what it is but also like not taking it so seriously that you're protecting it yeah you know i well i'm gonna uh close it up for today because cool. the interview closes soon but yeah, i yeah. wish i could keep interviewing you longer <laughs> thank you for coming today and um, we thank you for interviewing and speaking with us <laughs> thank you i appreciate you guys this is great okay end of interview close of interview <laughs>